What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bars. They sold to Kellogg for $600 million. Check out the interview. He talks about how they built it up. P90X founder of Tony Horton talks about how he made money as a street mime, Josh, before he sold hundreds of millions. That's how he actually made rent money and food money when he traveled across country as a street mime. And uh, founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, talked about when he was Steve Jobs' mentor that Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no, and, and many more people on Spread Insider. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Our mission at Rise25 is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. Uh, we do that. We've done that, Josh, for years just because we like doing it, but we did it through our Done For You services, which is a Done For You podcast service, which I believe is the best thing I've ever done for my business and my life. And I know you go on a lot of podcasts. You really love them. Um, And also a Done For You VIP event solution. We'll partner with large conferences and software companies, and we'll completely run a VIP event for them so they can just show up and hang out and deliver the content. Um, We do have a greater purpose um, and mission behind what we do, which is our Veteran Entrepreneur Scholarship. So if you go to rise25.com slash mission and you apply, if you know a veteran entrepreneur or you are one, apply. We give uh, scholarships to our events. Um, It could be sometimes an all-expense paid trip to the event ticket, flight, hotel, Um, and whatever it is to connect with other entrepreneurs to get your business to the next level. It's a longer story, but it has to do with my grandfather being a Holocaust survivor who escaped Nazi Germany, and my business partners at the same time's grandfather was a B-17 captain who flew 35 missions over Nazi Germany at the same time. So anyways, check out rise25.com slash mission. I am super excited to talk to, thank you to Ed O'Keefe for uh, making me aware of this uh, amazing entrepreneur, Josh Elizeche, who, fascinating enough, is legally changing his name to Josh Snow, and you'll see why in a minute, the bright white teeth maybe give you an indication. Um, But, you know, Josh, what people don't talk about as much is, um, you know, your family didn't have a computer Growing, when you were growing up, so you had one hour of computer time a day at the library. So if anyone has excuses of what they're not accomplishing, I think of things like you and some of these other entrepreneurs of you know, the opportunity that you just created. Um, and you taught yourself to program and to market online as a teenager. By age 22, he had a multi-million dollar company that he sold. Now he runs a private portfolio of multi-million dollar businesses. Every month, they, tens of millions of people visit their company's web properties. They have, um, you, you go to trysnow.com, they get a lot of press for the celebrities and partners like uh, that they have, Chuck Liddell, Rob Gronkowski, Floyd Mayweather, the Kardashians, Ms. Universe, it goes on and on. But what I, don't, I feel doesn't get talked about as much, uh, Josh, is just the giving nature. You donate for every sale to help children who can't afford dental treatments. You will spend time giving back by advising on the board of the Phoenix Coding Academy and the Fleischer Scholars uh, Program, which is a college enrichment for disadvantaged students. Um, but for you guys out there, try snow.com. Snow is a leader in premium oral health care products including patented teeth whitening systems, premium floss, anti-aging lip care products, and much more. Over 1 million monthly shoppers that make Snow the leader in premium oral care. Josh, thank you for joining me. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. There's so much to talk to just in the intro. Um, Talk about going all in for a second and change your name and just beyond going all in. Yeah. you know, I'm, first of all, I'm, you know, I'm not a dentist. Uh, I wanted to be a doctor growing up. I want to go to medical school. That was my dream, and uh, I stumbled into entrepreneurship. So I, I you know, I'm, entrepreneurship is not huge in my family. I think that the entrepreneurial spirit, I think, is huge uh, in, in my family. Uh, the resiliency and and all of that, the grit. Um, but uh, you know, I kind of came to a crossroad uh, a few years ago when I had sold one of my companies and. You know, I went out and you know bought the Lamborghini, you know, yellow Lamborghini convertible, and like I did all this stuff. I went and bought a Ferrari, and like, you know, because I, I ten years ago, literally ten years ago, was um, 
the last time I took the city bus. So I saw I used to take the city bus and I bought my own first car. It was a 1992 Toyota Camry. Mm. Uh, uh, for four thousand dollars, after I sold the website on on what it was called, Site Point Marketplace, which is now called Flippa, yeah. um, and so you know, um, I, I I knew that my family could probably not help be able to help me out with the car, and I was taking the city bus, and I was taking it at five in the morning because it kept breaking down all the time, and I can I couldn't rely on it, and I had mm. football this. But long story short, um, I, I was you know uh, twenty I'm twenty six now, so I was. 21, 22 years old. Um, I finished university when I was 20 at Arizona State University at the business school. And uh, I went all in after I graduated. I literally was working 16 hours a day, seven days a week. And mm. I, a lot of people say that. And I'm not saying that like I'm proud of it. I'm saying that's that was the nature of it. That's it what was, it took. That's what it took. And that's, that's what it was. And that's all I knew. Because I was so used to taking 22 credits a semester. I was in the honors college doing my master, my master honors thesis. And then I was running my business and my involved sports. Like I'm just used to doing five million things at once right. because I'm so happy to be alive. But I, I, I then switched over just to business. And so um, I burnt out. I didn't know it. Uh, it was delayed burnout after the acquisition. Um, I didn't know it. And I felt some inklings of depression, which I didn't, I never had felt like that. I didn't know what that was. What did you and experience I, at the time? Because not experiencing before, you seem like an upbeat, just go, go, go type of person. So I am. Yeah. I mean, I am, what was I am, what was that like for you at the time? It's kind of like a uh, you you're used to going you know 150 miles per hour, and then all of a sudden you're going 20 miles per hour, and you're like, whoa! And it's like your your mind, and your body have to catch up to that, and like uh, I don't know, you could do it the other way too. Like you can go from 20 miles to 150 miles per hour, and then you burn out, and then when you when you drop to 20, there's that that delta between the between the speed can elicit some depressive kind of uh, feelings. And I think it would, for me it was not lethargic, not wanting to get out of bed. Um, you know, I, I, I was kind of this quote unquote star boy where it was like, whatever I come out with next has to be bigger than what mm. I just did. A lot so of pressure, what, yeah. A lot of pressure, a lot of pressure, and a lot of internal pressure, by the way. It's not like anybody was telling me this. It was all inside my own head. Right. And uh, I realized that I have to have a purpose, a big one. I have to have a mission that's huge. I have to be working my whole life, and uh, and and you know one of my mentors, uh, Mort Fleischer, who I'm now partnered with on our foundation. I just got back from St. Louis talking to the kids at Washington University. Mm. Um, these are underserved high school juniors who are interested in business, want to go to college, or don't maybe have a role model in their community. Um, anyway, uh, you know Mort Fleischer, uh, 82 years old, he's partners with Warren Buffett. has raised you know 15 billion dollars in the public markets for, for real estate. He told me. Uh, you know, the reason he thinks he's still alive is because he's still going. He's the chairman of that company. And so for me, I was like, what could I do for 60 years that I would be proud to do and that even if I failed miserably, I would still be happy about? And like that check, those check boxes I started to create. Uh, and then I, I stumbled into snow because I had jaw surgery. They wired out my, you know, took out my jaw, wired it shut. Mm. I spent a lot of time with dentists and doctors and you know they'd see me pull up in my Lamborghini, and even though I wasn't deep down inside happy at the moment, they were like, "Clearly, this guy's got the trappings of success. Right. It's not daddy's money, it's not family money. They know that." So they're like, "What do you do? You must be an entrepreneur." So we became friends, and one day uh, I started researching the oral care market, and two of my best friends created a company called Tough the Needle, um, and that was a huge success story. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, bootstrapped. You know, in less than five years. Uh, they recently uh, merged with Serta Simmons. So anyway, that, that I saw that. I said, uh, as they were doing that, I had a background, uh, backstage view through, through all of that. And, uh, and I said, w w what is the industry or market I want to disrupt? And I'm willing to spend 50 years to do it and go all in. So you know, last year, we spent a few million dollars to create uh, our new uh, you know, uh, system, our teeth whitening system. And now as we expand to different categories, I put – you know, all my all but not all of my money, but I would say relative to the amount because I could have I could have just sat on the beach and not work for the rest of my life. Like I literally could do that. I, I still could, but I could have done that. Uh, but I realized very quickly, literally within six months after after having all that money and all that, I was like not happy. And it, it sounds cliche. It's like money buys happiness. Well, bubble like you hear both sides of the story. Mm -hmm. But for me, I needed I needed to put a stake in the ground and say. This is what I'm going to do for 50 years, and I'm going to go all in. And part of that 
finally to answer your, answer piece of your question is um, changing my last name. So, uh, you know, my last name, uh, I'm Basque. My my dad is is an immigrant from Spain. Left an amazing career there uh, to take on a, a an opportunity here in the U.S. And uh, my 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 last name is Basque. And um, you know, I'm my I'm really my father's only son. And so there's a lot that goes into that. Where it's a really big decision, yeah. Decision, but I said, you know what? I said, uh, you know, my kids down the line can, they don't have to go by snow. I can keep that name. I can change it again if I need to. But I said, I really want to, um, you know, aside from tattooing it on my body, I want to really, really make it part of that brand. Because the truth is, you can't follow the, the founder of Crest, the founder of Colgate, the founder of Sensodyne, but you can follow the founder of Snow. And I want to stand in front of that brand in this, this amazing opportunity now that upstarts can take on big companies and and really Crest and Colgate are not really our competition. I love I love them. Yeah. You know, I'm a huge Well, you have fan. a different position in the market. You're more of a premium, you know. And I'm going to tease this for a second and don't show it yet, but you know, I know we talked before hitting record and you'll show us what a $10,000 system looks like. Um, don't show it yet. You know, just keep oh, watching, but it's, it's, it's hidden. It's hidden. It's Okay, here. good. Okay, good. Um, and the other piece is you were awarded a trademark. So talk about that because you you know you didn't have to do that and you spent a lot of money and time doing that as well. Yeah. So what happened is that, um, you know, as I was talking to my team, we kind of said, what what's the big mission? You know, we are in the business of delivering confidence and helping inspire confidence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we we help uh, the community out with the 18 million American children who don't have access to dental care. Okay, great. We never lead with the marketing on that. That was one thing as a marketer I said, we will never lead with that. We will not be the Toms where we, we simply lead with that. We will lead with our products being patented, mm -hmm. the best of the best, looking good and working. And then we will lead with some celebrity help <coughs> and certain brands we partner with, that's it. And in the background, we've chosen to, 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 to help our cause, but then I said, okay, what's the big like brand goal? And we well, kind of came- just to, just to say one thing, Josh, I had to yeah. dig on the about page, all the way at the bottom. First, of, yeah, like you were saying front and center, yeah, you're in the video, so like there's a face with the product, but I had to dig all the way at the bottom to find out that you guys actually donate sales for for each of the, you know, uh, you, you donate to each of, for each of the sales to her, for dental health. So yeah, it's not front and center, which some people argue like, why not? But I, I totally get your point. And I have no problem, and I, I yeah. am not denigrating anyone who chooses to do that, that not at all tom's shoes whatever tom's shoes are great you know and and i love i love all of that one for one model is amazing we've got a similar one for one model but uh we decided to do it internally as a company and because we know we are powerful marketers it's it's too easy i, I and i hate to say that but it's too easy to just leave with that and then make people feel bad like i just i, I don't believe in that i want to i want the hardest my, my whole life has been about chasing difficulty and all of my success has come from chasing difficulty. And so I, I try to train that to my team as well. And so, you know, we said we want to be we want to be known right next to snow, the actual element that falls from the sky mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. snow, the oral care, personal care brand. And we want people to be like, uh, you know, wearing if, you're, if I'm wearing a snow hat, which has happened you know, to me and my team members where, you know, we're at a restaurant and the server will come up and say, Oh my God! Is that is that because you ski, or is that because of the teeth whitening brand mm. or whatever? So it's pretty we want to yeah. synonymous from that, that from a brand perspective. And so um, you know, for us, uh, we, we're we're all in, and I've you know I've gone all in, and so now we say, okay, whatever happens, we're going to keep pushing. This is this is a uh, it's a marathon. You're building a brand, especially in a in a deep seated space like oral care and personal care, it takes a long long time. Um, but we said, okay. Could we do this for 50 years? Uh, would we be happy? Are we happy year by year what we're doing? And we're racing the marathon, and it's just it's very exciting. And you know we're a tiny little peanut compared to you know the Crest and Colgates and all these guys, but we want to earn the right to be on a shelf next to those those strong brands. Hmm, totally. I want you know a big um, piece of it. I think when you talk is you really value mentors, and so I wanted you to talk a little bit about you know, one of your mentors, you said Mort, and then I also want you to talk about your dad. Um, how did you meet, is it Mort? Yeah, Mort, yeah. yeah. How'd you meet him? 
So I was actually a part of the very, very first year uh, of the program. So, mm. so, so Mort, uh, uh, you know, invented this program uh, in a partnership with Arizona State University. And uh, my dad, who was working at the post office, um, uh, was reading the newspaper like he does every day and saw Sliver in there for the program. And it was like, you know, high school juniors who are interested in business, who want to go to college, mm. you know, come from, you know, uh, underserved backgrounds, blah, blah, blah. He clipped it out and left it on the counter for me because my dad worked a night shift uh, to make a few a few extra bucks an hour. Uh, and so we would communicate through the counter. So the kitchen counter, he mm. would leave articles for me. My dad's big into um, quantum physics and just a, one of the smartest guys I know still to date. And, uh, you know, he would leave me kind of things around biology and, you know, biotech stuff like that so he left me the sliver and i read it and i was like i have two days to apply with a deadline and i was like i am interested in business and this was interesting because my dad uh my dad's and both my, uh, my parents are the most supportive uh, parents you know i could ask for but you know entrepreneurship in a in a family like ours is the most risky thing you can go for and you know my dad was like you know uh that's very scary please just stay in school and i made mm. an agreement with my dad that i would keep good grades and he would let me essentially do what i wanted to do uh, on the computer. He didn't know what I was doing, but he's like, you keep doing what you're doing. I don't know what it is. But you better keep your grades up. Right. So I, they, I got straight A's after that because I didn't want my dad on my back and I don't want my mom concerned. So he left his sliver and it was the first time where my dad kind of was nudging toward what I had inside of me, mm -hmm. which I, I honestly felt embarrassed about. I felt embarrassed to tell my family that I didn't want to go to medical school. I was embarrassed to say I want to be an entrepreneur. I was scared. And so I said, wow, my dad's actually kind of nudging me. I'm like, heck yeah, I'm going to do this. So mm -hmm. I applied. And I met, I met more, you know, uh, that first day of the program and he talked about coming, you know, coming from nothing and, you know, his, his, his parents passing away and, and living with his uncle in, in St. Louis and, um, kind of going through a similar rise through, you know, he's 82 years old. So, um, uh, you know, when he went to work on wall street, he could only work at, uh, firms that, that, that hired, uh, you know, Jewish bankers and mm. like going through that process. And kind of being a Hispanic minority, um, you know, want to be entrepreneur at the time, there were some thoughts in my head about like, I'm just some poor Hispanic kid, like I'm not gonna be able to make it. And seeing what he was able you had, to like, do. like negative self-talk at the time. Negative <laughs> self-talk. And I meet this guy who started with zero dollars, you know, and, and built an empire um, by just pushing forward. And that sparked that entrepreneurship with my dad's support and like, mm -hmm. heck yeah. So then yeah. I came it's back. It's like that Roger Bannister, right? You just can yes. see it being done and... Just seeing it gives you, oh wow, I could do it too, type of thing. Well, and he, you know, he at, at his age, and you know, I met him. He was, you know, 72, 73 at the time, and um, he he was kind of entering that phase of, you know, I don't give a shit what people think about me. I'm going to say what I want. I'm in the le legacy stage of my life. Right. So we just clicked right away. I became a mentor in the program, and then uh, as my businesses started to explode, you know, we became, started meeting more and more often. And then he started sharing stuff, but really my early mentors, aside from my dad, um, were on YouTube and Google and just like searching, you know, Jean-Paul DeJoria from Paul Mitchell Cosmetics, uh, hair care, uh, you know, Bill Gates and, you know, you name it, Michael Dow, and the list goes on and on. I would just watch their interviews. Everything I could find on someone I kind of connected to, the John D. Rockefeller, Cornelius Vanderbilt, I read everything I could on these guys and saw that they came from very similar backgrounds as me. And it kind of shattered that limiting belief of um, that I can't, you know, I can't do that. Like, I can't be that big. Like, I don't know. And it's like, I can do this. And so every single piece of content that would come out from, you know, those people, obviously, Cornelius Vandenberg, John D. Rock, I read everything I could, but Steve Jobs and, you know, all this going on. I remember watching the very first Apple iPhone announcement and how Steve Jobs talked with, with magnetism about, the, the, the product, this magnetic charisma he had on stage, and this passion and love for the product. And I said, one day, I would love to talk about the products we create like that. Hmm. And I, I literally fell in love with the way Steve Jobs talked about his business, the way John Paul DeJoria. And so those are my early mentors. We're online through books, through forums, and that really kept me going, kept me pushing. Uh, and then eventually, the people around me started to see that it wasn't just a, a random, you know, ink, inkling of feeling. I want to be an entrepreneur. Like this guy's actually an entrepreneur, and and now I'm fortunate to have the community and be on podcasts and do all this because I want to be hopefully a light for someone who is maybe doubting themselves or maybe wants to take it to the next level. And so you know, my thing is, 
you know, now that, you know, Snow is, is, a, is valued as a nine figure brand, it's like, how do we get to 10 figure brand? Not because I need or want the money. You know, I take zero dollars out of Snow. Like I don't, I don't fund my lifestyle from Snow. Um, I've got different businesses and I've been in business for 12 years. Snow is really my, my all in thing. You know, it's not like my, I'm gonna get a Lambo, you know, from doing this. It's, you know, and that's, by the way, has been able, I think, a piece of what has attracted eight players because they know that Josh is not just doing this to get rich. Uh, you know, Josh is already set up, he's good. He's doing this to prove a point. And people wanna be a part of a story like that. Josh, what's something, when you think of Mort, um, you talked about a few lessons you learned from him, but what about directly him giving you advice on something? Maybe you're going in one direction and his advice kind of took it in another direction or just something he said that just helped the trajectory of what you're doing. Yeah, it was him and then one of my other mentors who unfortunately passed away, um, uh, Bruce is the founder of Discount Tire, multi-billion dollar you know, tire company, uh, tire retailer. And I remember asking Bruce, I'm like, why don't you guys sell other car parts? Why don't you guys do oil changes? He said, it's not our business. And I go, Bruce, how come you don't manufacture your own products? You're the number one seller of tires in the world, uh, you know, direct to consumer. And, uh, and he says, that's not our business. Never play another man's game. Hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and Mort has continually ushered me along and challenged me intellectually to level up the way I think about my future, my business. And, you know, him being... The, the founder of three separate New York Stock Exchange companies um, talking about the struggles of being a public company and how there are two businesses when you're a public company. You're the, in the business of being public and the business of running and growing a business. Right. And thinking about that, and Bruce never went public. And so, you know, he built a $6 billion net worth um, selling one product for 50 years. Amazing. On. And so, and the way that his team admired him, um, you know, when he passed away, the, the funeral uh, and the ceremony was overfilled with people, with press. Uh, you know, press wasn't allowed in, but filled with employees who literally, you know, every single person, there was not one bad thing someone could say about him as a leader. And so I saw that and I said, I want to be admired for my leadership. So I have to emulate what these people have the, the empathy, giving credit to others, integrity, always following through with what you, what you say and do. Um, and that's something more, you know, lives by as well as personal brand. He, you know, he's had multiple companies, maybe 20, 30 different companies, three on the New York Stock Exchange. What's the one company he's, he, he's most, uh, he puts him highest warrants himself, his own personal brand. And then leveling up your legal, leveling up your accounting, leveling up your team, going after better and better people, um, you know, and really putting your hands deep into the business and not pretending like you're too good to do something. Um, that all those things that I kind of watched, but also, you know, Mort, for example, will say, Josh, you know, if you're going to, you know, if you're thinking about raising money, you need to, you've, you've got a great accounting, whatever, but go and talk to Ernst and Young, go and talk to Deloitte. And for me, I'm like, really? Like talk to Ernst and Young? Like, aren't they really expensive? He goes, go to this law firm. He connected me to a law firm. They have 5,000, um, uh, attorneys, you know, in their company. And he says, and I was like, aren't they expensive? He goes, well, Josh, if they don't know the answer, they pick up the phone and literally call the guy across the, the way from him or the other one or the other one or the other one. Within a few minutes, they've got the answer. So it's about the time and the expertise mm. and you can't be messing around. The last thing that he really harps on is not letting your ego get ahead of you. And he's like, ego will destroy will destroy a man uh, and his success. And so, you know, he's constantly challenging me. He lets me. What do you think he means by that? Well, you know, uh, I've seen it. I've seen it happen, um, and I, I catch myself every once in a while. That's why I think having the nonprofit program and, and traveling around the U.S. and talking to universities uh, and, and seeing the children remembering I was in their exact chair mm. and where I come from and right. giving back while I'm growing businesses is really allows me to stay grounded. The other thing is, at, at, at my core, even though I drive around a McLaren, I'm actually at my core. I'm a simple guy. Like I just love to work. I love to inspire. And just realizing that I'm a peanut compared to my some of my competitors, mm. and how more I have to grow, and never saying like, oh, I, you know, we're doing so well, I'm like kind of getting complacent, um, and realizing when I get complacent, I be, I do become unhappy. So like con continually realizing, here's where I'm at, here's where I think we could be, and we've got a limited time to get there, and I've got to buckle down. And the other thing too is, yeah, you know, people don't want to work or be led by someone who is egotistical like that not very long uh, or who has a dictator way of leadership I'm not that way naturally but 
it is easy when you are young, you're making a lot of money to feel like, you know, you move aside and you don't know who I am and just like that type of fun. I catch myself sometimes if I start to slip into anywhere near that. Yeah. And yeah. I think what more it means is that, you keeping know, that humbleness, keeping the humbleness, you know, being relatable, uh, being yourself. I mean, honestly, being, the best thing that money has given me is that I can be myself. And if somebody uh, doesn't like it, uh, that's unfortunate, but it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't have to, you know, bend over for somebody because I, I need them. You know, I, I'm self-sufficient. We have a brand that's self-sufficient. We have no outside funding. Like for, for me, it's like, who do we, who are, are we really, who are we really serving the customer, the market, our, our partners? And how can I wake up and go to sleep every night saying, I wake up saying, how can I be a better leader to my, my team? How can I be a better inspiration for the community and a role model? And how can I be a better partner, aka help my partners make more money? Uh, and how and help them ex, ex, and see more opportunities and keep this company growing. If you if you look at that and you kind of put that at Mount Everest and you realize you're right here chugging along with everybody else, I'm no one special. I you know I, I I'm I'm not entitled to anything. I've got to work and earn for every single thing that we have. And once you just really instill that and then combine that with abundance instead of scarcity, you're like I'm not going to share my ideas. Or I'm not going to do this or I. Or, and giving credit, practicing giving credit over the years for me uh, has been so, so valuable in a thousand ways. And it's really keeps, it keeps you humble. Yeah. Je so, Josh, I want to talk about because you have a great approach um, to partnerships. And I know you talk about this. You want win, win, win. You want everyone in, in the deal to win. But first, I want to get into a little bit about um, the expansion. And you have re some really interesting views on thinking on another level and you could tell that when you listen to some of your thoughts of you know specifically when I've done research on you talking about owning the supply chain owning the data turning that company into not only what you do but like technology company so talk a little bit about the expansion of the brand because I know you guys aren't people know you as try snow the teeth whitening but there's there's much more behind that yeah I mean it's like uh you know Jeff Bezos um and, and, and I'm in no way trying to compare myself to him. He's an incredible visionary and has built something that, that I, I can, can't even fathom. But uh, like they started with books, you know, but really he, he named it Amazon because he knew that like the Amazon River, it would gain it would give access and life to a lot of industries. But he needed something that made sense. And if you look at catalogization and the availability and access to inventory in a seemingly infinite, um, uh, infinite world like books, a uh, bookstore can only carry so many titles. And he realized the internet kind of shattered that. Um, and so just like Google said, we want to index the entire internet. They started with this huge idea. It says, we're going to start with blank. Um, you know, Elon Musk is, I want to fly to Mars. I want to, you know, own all the energy on this planet and I want to make it better for everybody. But I've got to sell some sexy cars in the meantime. Right. And so for me, it's like, you know, when we look at our brand, we say, how can we elevate the aesthetic standard and the quality standards for personal care and oral care? And starting with teeth whitening, because that's a, a, an area we felt like we could really innovate upon. We could really create something 10 times better. <clears throat> it's kind of like a Peter Thiel. Uh, Peter Thiel has been um, you know, a, a virtual mentor of mine. And I had the opportunity to meet him when I was um, I was a semifinalist in his program where he pays you 100000 to drop mm. out of school yeah yeah uh, so I it was like zero to, it was like before his zero to one book or whatever yeah 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 and so i've been a huge peter till fan the way he thinks about uh ideas and and being magnitude better than your competition and then i'm a huge fan of blue ocean strategy and all that so thinking through that i said okay now we've got our anti-aging lip care line so we're in the mouth right around the mouth uh soon we'll be a little bit around the face but thinking through how can we really um uh reimagine the entire oral care aisle but in addition to that, what else complements our brand? So expanding into taking our design focus, our, our technology background. You know, I studied computer information systems in school. We have one of the best engineering teams, I believe, on the planet. We can really we create real true technology that looks really good, that is super simple to use in a market that is that grows with population. So like for us, it's it's you know toothpaste, mouthwash. We launch our floss. People are in love with our activated charcoal floss. They love our anti-aging lip scrub, our anti-aging lip balm. They use it all day. And so we're like, okay, what else can we do that's not like 
you know, foot like socks. We're not going to sell socks. But what is like right there in that area that allows snow to continue to, 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 to connect to customers and give them a product that is 10 times better? And so that's what we're thinking about now is what are those expansion categories? And then what is the prioritization level to it? What do our customers want and need and what, what do we think they'll appreciate? Um, because that a lot of times is a different question altogether. Uh, what is the market we think need? Where's the gap? And then how do we combine that with our current stage of where we're at? I'd love to have 500 products right now. That's not the case. I think, I think at a billion dollars in revenue, we may have, you know, 15 products. Um, it's not one of those things that, you know, Casper mattress and tough, my buddies at tough to needle, you know, they sold one product, one mattress. Of course you had the queen, the twin and the king, but it was one type of mattress. That's it. And they did that until they were well over a hundred million dollars in revenue uh, before they came out with the pillow. Even though everyone was like, come out the pillow, come out with this. It's the next best affordable. They stayed state. focused for a long state time. Focused. That's And building that market is key. Yeah. Talk about the data. You know, I thought, you know, the conversation I've heard you've talked about um, the technology and even the insurance piece. Talk about your thoughts on that because I thought that was interesting on where you're, where you're going, where the puck's going, not where it is. Well, you know, I'll take a step back, and, and, and we, you know, we were the first company to um, innovate on connecting our um, our patented LED technology to the phone, and then um, you know, people thought that was a great idea. So naturally, we started to pick up competitors. And before we were too focused on ourselves, you focus on competitors. You can focus on competitors all day long. We focus on our customers, um, and I focus on our team. Um, but you know, uh, you know, we were too small. We didn't have the resources at the time to fight everybody and take people down. I said, all we can do is run faster and innovate faster. And anyone copying us is always gonna be at least two steps behind. I, I played chess growing up. Um, chess is still one of my favorite games. And you've gotta be four, five, six steps ahead. You gotta think of as many probabilities as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, I thought about how can we really build a moat? You know, Warren Buffett talks about building the moat all the time. And I said, well, you know, if you look at the dental data, uh, primary dental data, generally dentists are, are the holders of that data, but because of HIPAA laws and all that, it's hard for them to, uh, it's hard for them to share that with uh, research companies and insurance companies, et cetera. Uh, so I said, well, what if we could help, um, help raise uh, the awareness of oral hygiene to the 180 countries we ship to right now, but also collect data that wasn't just for the sake of making money, but actually to understand uh, oral hygiene habits around the world. And you know they just came out with a study. I think uh, Time published a study around connecting it to Alzheimer's, uh, periodontal disease, dental disease. Oh, it's definitely linked to heart disease. I mean, there's there's a lot of links to poor dental health to a lot of different major issues that people don't realize. Well, we thought you know there are there are established organizations like the insurance world, uh, like the pharmaceutical world, that you know the biggest study on cancer came out connecting dental disease to to 34 percent increased risk in, in cancer hmm. and we said look we can't we can't do everything ourselves but who are partners that while we're while we're doing good um we can do good and like how can we support the the world with with one thing that we're good at which is data and my whole world the last 12 years has been around data so you know as people use our products we're collecting you know hundreds of points of data um, and then thinking through how can we utilize this data to potentially help uh, in any way come out with a treatment that is successful for Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, my, my, my grandmother passed away from Alzheimer's. Mm, since sorry to hear that. Yeah. Me. Uh, you know, cancer and like how can we contribute to society as a whole totally. and make it part of our legacy. And we realize data is something that we're, we're really, really good at. We have a massive head start. Mm. Um, and so that's something that we're starting to incorporate more and more. Um, as we continue to sell product. Yeah, the, the founders I talked to, like um, the Quest Nutrition, you know, Tom Billy was talking, when I interviewed him about, they they weren't trying to sell bars necessarily, he was trying to help metabolic disease. You know, they kind of transitioned to doing research and that sounds like that's, you know, the direction, the, the things that you guys are thinking about and doing. Um, Talk about, there were three things that we talked a little about before, which was the online to offline, the product line, and the zero dollars. Um, talk to about the online to offline components. You've been yeah. doing this marketing thing a long time. You're young, you've been doing it a long time. Um, talk about the, those thoughts. Yeah, I mean, the truth is in our space, um, 
you know, we, uh, uh, you know, we dominate, in, at least in the U.S., uh, we dominate the online ecosystem for definitely for teeth whitening and eventually our other products. But, um, you know, we look at it and say, where are people buying uh, oral care right now? They, they, they run out of toothpaste. They see it at the store and they throw it in their basket, you know, next to the toilet paper. Um, you know, it's, it's a need to have, not a want to have. And so we've created a giftable uh, category inside of a really a dormant space and so we know that the majority of purchase volume is happening offline, the overwhelming majority. Yeah. So for us, um, you know, uh, we're, we're picking select retailers. We, we haven't gone to a trade show. We don't do any outbound for retail. But the inbound retail has been really interesting. Uh, we, we, we're on our third, or I think we're on our fourth test with, with the Nordstrom property and uh, looking at select premium retail. Um, you know, I'm going on TV sorry, next month with the QVC group at HSN. Nice. Um, and so getting in front of more people through TV, getting in front of them where they shop already and realizing that, you know, you look at Target's a great example. They brought Casper in, they brought Harry's in. And so like we're looking at how can we get in front of our customers? Because the reason why people, the reason why we're not 10 times our size right now, I believe the first thing people think is, does it work? The second thing is, um, you know, uh, does it, does it work for me, et cetera? And the second is around price. But if they can touch and feel the product and they can see it, um, I buy stuff all the time that I don't even look up the reviews for. It's just there in the store and I just store it in my cart. And I'm like, cool, I need that. I want that. So we want to be there. And we also believe that we um, we can be really, really good channel partners for our retailers. We're never going to lose our direct-to-consumer. Uh, we're never going to have more than 50% of our sales come from retail. But it presents you know, a, a multi-billion dollar opportunity eventually for us yeah. to be in retail. Yeah. Uh, and it also challenge, challenges us to become better and better online so that we can support and drive customers to our retail partners. We're seeing a lot of that, right? I mean, you look at Warby Parker, you right. know, they start with direct to consumer and then they branch into retail, right? And so, what are some of the retail channels you think are ideal for you? If someone's listening, what, what, should, what should you be in or what you're exploring? Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're looking at we're looking at you know pop up stores, you know, in, in select cities, so that we can talk to our customers, meet our customers, and get in front of potential customers and show them our product. Uh, we're very proud of what we built, uh, you know, and with our, uh, you know, we, we've got our upcoming uh, toothpaste, um, you know, that's 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 being made right now, and we want people to taste test it. You know, we want people to to actually try it out. And, you know, when we say trysnow.com, we want you to try snow offline as well. And so we're looking at a kiosk model, pop-up shop model, and then we're starting to you know, partner with big retailers and department stores so that, you know, customers can see the product. So we're looking at kind of an array of that. We started right. with men's spas and dentists. So That's what I was thinking. Like when you say snow, try snow, I'm thinking this should be like a dental franchise or something. Yeah, well, that's the thing. So dentists sell. Dentists love selling our product um, because if you look at teeth whitening, they don't they don't make a lot of money. You know, teeth whitening, they, they uh, whitening teeth. They use it as a lead generation or customer generation tool, and they do it because customers ask for it. You know, patients ask for it. But if you just want to whiten your teeth, it is cumbersome to have to go into a dental office. Also, it takes time away from the dentist. The hygienist is expensive. So we said, look, we can get the same results if you just put our product on your shelf. If a if a patient's like, oh, hey, I want to whiten my teeth. Cool. You have two options. Um, we have two options. You can take Snow Home. Oh, I've seen that. I've seen so and so using that on social media. I've been wanting it. Does it really work, doctor? Yes, it works. You know, here it is. Um, or would you like us to do one of the traditional methods? That's you know maybe a little bit more expensive. So giving them the choice and putting a product that gets in front of 15 million people, putting it in their office. Every single dentist and every med spa who carries a product is sold mm. out, mm. Um, and they don't do any marketing around it. They just put it on their shelf. We do all the marketing. So it's important because it breaks down the does it work kind of objection, you know? Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, and so we talked about the product line, the zero dollars piece. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're talking about from the from the yeah. product? Yeah, from you, you know, the decision not to take outside investment. Yeah, yeah. Um I mean, I don't know if I did it consciously i think that i've just been so used to i've helped a lot of companies raise a lot of money um i've even done investments multiple investments myself as an angel investor so i'm not like uh and one thing one thing i did learn from from mort is is opm and opn and op everything other people's network other people's <laughs> money uh you know when opp hire, no. people's everything yeah literally everything. 
Um, and that's the irony of capitalism and stuff is that you have to help other people's uh, other. You have to align your self interest. And you know what, what we looked at is initially, if we went out to raise money, they see a teeth whitening company, and it's like, that's great. You know, you got a teeth whitening product, cool. I wanted to self fund this as long as possible, and I, I still am. Um, and we still haven't made the full on decision to necessarily raise money. We're looking at maybe a friends and family, and then maybe a you know, Series A. But when I look at the international. Uh, expansion abilities and the huge head start we have in the US I say okay the, the really the, the main threat we have in our space is someone raising a lot of a lot of money out the gate and, and trying to catch up to us and that's a threat that is that is real it also you know as we look at retail if we're if, if we do a Costco deal or we do a target deal and they put both put in five million dollar purchase orders I've got to take away from my online support and and support that and I don't want to lose that leverage. So mm. now I look at, okay, how can I utilize other people's money who see the vision of what we're building? We're so much further than we were even a year ago. They start to see that and say, holy crap, this company could IPO for billions of dollars. Smile Direct Club IPOing. They're worth $4 billion right now. They're going to IPO probably at $8 billion valuation. They're the first company of our kind to do that. And so the, the VCs and everybody around them are like, we missed out on Smile Direct Club. Who else is out there? Well, there are very few websites or brands that get in front of more people than us and online. And in the influencer world, it's definitely not in our space we dominate that. And so they're like, okay, that's where we want to be. And then what are you going to use the money on? And it's like uh, to fund this Costco purchase order and to fund this Target purchase order. And we need some more inventory and I need a couple more staff. They're like, oh, that's low risk versus I need the money to build the product or to do this. Again, they'll do it. Go Silicon Valley. That's what it's all about. But once someone see, they see our vision a lot more now, and it starts to make a lot more sense that it's cheaper for me to raise fifty million dollars right now than it was a year ago. And what could I do with fifty million dollars? I can put us in every store, you know, internationally that makes sense in the next three years. And I can do Super Bowl commercial, and I can bring on bigger celebrities. I can attract the other thing too. Press writes about companies generally that have raised money, and A players who are coming from big corporations want to know that you're not going anywhere. And no matter how much they believe in me, I'm not going anywhere, this business isn't going anywhere, until you say, look, we've got $25 million we just raised yeah. from big, big They like to see that safety backing. It's true, it is what it is, and I don't blame them. I don't blame them. So, one thing that's really interesting, I mentioned the, the front of the interview is, the way you approach and structure celebrity partnerships. Um, so I don't know which one would be most interesting to talk about. I know you have Chuck Liddell, Floyd Mayweather, Rob Gronkowski, and more. Which which would be interesting to talk about a little bit of how you actually approach and, and structure those. Well, I mean, it's really it's really an art, right? It's like there's a certain science to it in terms of you know um, who matches the audience and all that. And we went after men initially because we wanted to kind of uh, uh, break the mold around only women, you know, care about their smile, and whiten their teeth and all that. And so if you look at, you know, uh, my partners, Chuck Liddell and Rob Gronkowski, they both use mouthpieces. You know, Chuck's semi-retired or retired, and I, I guess Rob is now retired, but you know, they're using mouthpieces to, to, to tackle people, to beat people up and all that stuff. And it's mm. like, oh, wait, these are manly men who use mouthpieces, the same thing. This just happens to whiten teeth. Um, so anyway, um, the way we look at that is, um, if it's a big celebrity, someone that we see we could be with for 10 years, one, we want them to use the product or already be a customer. A lot of our celebrity partners, they were customers first. They paid full price for the product. They use the product and then they approach us. And, and, and so having a really good product you can stand by is key. I think our positioning helps. Um, we spend a lot of money on product development and packaging and all this. So it makes sense that a celebrity would use our product. So those are some of the things under the, the tip of the iceberg. But ultimately, it's like approaching the people who we do approach. We think about how do they, what type of uh, response do they elicit from their audience? Do they make people smile? Are they funny? Mm. Um, are they aspirational? So if they match those things, then it's like, how can we work with someone like that? Um, and we really run the gamut. You've got Rob Gronkowski, he's a football player, a dude's dude. And then you've got like Demi Lee, Demi Lee who's Miss Universe. Uh, on the other side, who's the softest, nicest, smart, you know, all, you can run the gamut. And what we're really showing is that everybody 
wants a nice smile and it, it, we can do that we're generally if you're just like a you know uh, a, a, an underwear brand for women like Victoria's Secret or some lingerie there's you know you're not gonna have guys up there you know it's like there's a certain thing for us we want to show that we're in this we're in a space where seven billion people have teeth and and everybody want values confidence and a nice smile and so the way we structure them is it can be it can be a mix of things like equity being at the highest level but you know, licensing, royalty, revenue, cash, a mix of all those, um, and really getting the celebrity excited about what we're doing. And if they're not excited, like if they're certainly not getting equity and maybe even not getting royalty or licensing stuff, if they don't see at least a piece of what we see. If they just see us as a money grab at the agent or the manager, just like, nice, these guys are doing really well, let's charge them a lot of money. If that's the case, there are too many celebrities for me to work with. I, I want to work with the ones who really use the product and, and, and really see the vision. Yeah. One thing that you do is you make sure everyone's taken care of in the deal. I love your philosophy on that. Talk about what that means. Well, the thing is, is like they call me sometimes. I, I've been called the, and I thought it was hilarious the first time I got called like uh, the elephant hunter, like awkward, awkward elephants in the room. Like, <laughs> I just, I come in and I'm just like, you know, I don't want to waste anybody's time. And it's like, you know, um, when I started working in Hollywood uh, with these agents uh, and in New York, um, I would come in and I would be like, because I, I didn't know the space. Like I just came in and I'm just like, uh, how do you make money? And you know, like just straight up, like how do you make money? And they were like, at first I kind of laugh and be like, whoa, like that's really direct. But then after a while they, re- they started to appreciate it because they realized why I was asking. You come from a different place, yeah. I'm an outsider, I'm just like, hey, I don't know any of this stuff. You know it way better than me. Um, how do you make money? How does he make money? And I'm like literally at the table. I'm like, how do you make money? How do you make money? What's the success for you? What's the success for you? What would make you say no to this deal? What might make you say yes? <clears throat> Just coming straight up and, and then saying, okay, you make X percent of what we're going to pay. Um, you get paid an hourly because you're the, the, the legal, you're the attorney. Well, let's have you do the work. Uh, how can I help you? Maybe you can help us with other deals and other contracts. And then the agent is like, who's in your portfolio? Who else might make sense? Um, how can we guarantee minimums on the licensing and royalty? Um, you know, is there a way that you can get involved because you're doing a lot of work? So, like, even if at the highest level again, getting a super eight, super manager, you know, involved on the equity level is something that is interesting as well because that person is is really working for us day in and day out on the celebrity. We're not talking to celebrity every single day. I text a few of them; they're friends of mine now, but. It's the agent, the management team that is working on it. It's the lawyers, the accountants. How do I get them involved? If they want to be, how do I get them involved in what we're doing? And then all of a sudden, it's easier for them to pick up the call when I call in, and they're a lot happier to pick up the call. Yeah. It's it's a motivation thing. Think about it is some of these people, I mean, do they really need more money or want more money? So you're kind of getting at the core of what else would be beneficial to them? Right, right. I mean, it's like, it's trying to figure out, it's always about aligning self-interest. And my belief is that um, uh, intuitively everybody's selfish, uh, inherently I would say, uh, and that's okay, it's, 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 it's totally okay. I don't mean that in a bad way. It's simply like, okay, um, you know, uh, if I couldn't provide value to your audience, and if I felt like, you know, you didn't have authority and that this, this interview would never get published or something like that, it's just aligning self-interest at the very core level. Even with employees and team members, you know, some 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 of my team members value recognition more than others. Everybody values it. Some value recognition and having a title more than others. Some um, want, you know, uh, you know, they have an expensive lifestyle. Or they're planning for something. They want to make money. My sales guys, you know, they they want that opportunity. How do I align? what they want with what I want in a win-win situation, not a devious way of putting a mask over it, but purely just simply, you know, when I sit down and do uh, planning for, for the team, uh, team member by team member, it's like, okay, what would be a success for you? What do you, where do you want to be in five years? And how can I help you get there? And it threw the vehicle of snow. And the result is you get your goal and snow hopefully becomes a more powerful brand. It's a process that whether you stay with us 50 years or not, um, luckily, uh, you know, I've never had to fire anybody, you know, in three years and it, it, we're really careful with who we bring on. But, uh, I think that it attracts a certain type of person who's tired of working at, 
an organization where they might be making 150,000 a year or 100,000 a year, but they'll take a pay cut and even move to Arizona because they see what we're building and they want to be a part of that. And they also uh, hopefully see a selfless leader who is de- who's gone all in, who's devoted his life to this, and they feel comfortable and safe that they're going to be able to build in an environment where they're supported, they're trusted, and he's going to be around for a long time. Yeah. Josh, I always ask at the end, first of all, thank you. This has been fantastic. I love hearing what you're building, what you're doing, and your thoughts along the way. Um, I always ask at the end, since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment? And on the flip side, what's been a, a really proud moment for you? And then at the end, we could show this uh, system that you have uh, covered up in a bag. But um, what's been a low moment for you that you had to push through? Well, I mean, well, it was it, honestly the if I look at the last ten years, uh, obviously I had that period of realizing it wasn't the pursuit to happiness, but the pursuit is happiness for me. I have to have a vehicle as an entrepreneur. You've got to keep moving, uh, and not everybody's wired the same way. But I just realized that was for me. And then uh, learning to ask for help mm-hmm. and learning how to. I've always been pretty good at delegating, but I, I, I'm still working on it. Like becoming better and better at. Um, you know, hiring great people and supporting them and being the best leader that you can be, not having an ego. And so some of the low points in my life have come from, uh, you know, not asking for help and letting something get to a point where then I'm embarrassed to ask for help mm. because I didn't help early on. Right. And then I feel alone in those times because when you are the entrepreneur, there are certain things, you know, if something's got to be done or something's broken, uh, yes, I have an amazing team. They're all over it. Uh, and generally things don't break. But when they do, I've got to stay up to four in the morning or not sleep tonight. You know, like ultimately I'm, I am the leader of the ship. I've got to do it. And if something happens, my team makes a mistake, I've got to step up and I've got to take responsibility for that mistake because I am the leader of this team and I am going to I am going to protect my team to, to the day I die. So stepping up in those moments, but realizing I should have asked for help hmm. earlier. I should have involved people earlier. That that has gotten me into trouble for sure. Why do you think people hesitate in asking for help? I mean, why do I why do I hesitate from it? Yeah. Um, I I think, and, and this might match you know the the general consensus, but uh, I'm used to. Uh, I, I you know when I started, I did everything myself. I built a website, I designed it, mm. I marketed it, I did everything myself, and you learn the self sufficiency. Um, and it becomes, it becomes a habit almost. It becomes a habit. I mean, yeah, I would call it a habit. It's a bad habit. Um, and you, and the thing that kind of shattered for me is that, um, if I want to build a billion dollar brand, I can't do it alone. Um, I, I, I couldn't even build, you know, we're, we're a hundred million dollar brand. I, I certainly could not have built that alone either. I, I, I could build, I think, uh, cause I've done it. I can build one to $10 million brands left and right over and over again. But to build something big, you have to ask for help and realizing that, what do I want more? Do I want to feel like weak or embarrassed? I don't feel weak when I ask for help. I feel empowered actually, but I think that a lot of it was learning you, that bad habit of self sufficiency I can do it myself. And not even saying like, <clears throat> not even saying like I don't trust people, I trust everybody. I'm a macro manager, I'm not a micro manager. <laughs> but I think also uh, shielding my team from certain things, being like, this is really difficult. I don't want to bog down my, my team member on this stuff. I'll just figure it out. Mm. I'll just figure it out. That kind of, you know, uh, leadership of saying like, I, you know what? I don't want to give this to him. It's, you know, he's probably not going to like it or it's probably going to piss him off. I'll absorb it. I'll absorb it. Mm. When instead, the team, if you hire good people, they want to learn that with you. They want to be right next to you. It's a learning opportunity. So when the site breaks, I don't go in and say, what the heck's going on? The site's broken. I'm like, this is amazing that the site's broken. And my team's like, what? Like, we, we're not getting, and sales aren't coming in. The checkout doesn't work. I'm like, I understand that, guys. But look, this is one day in a 50 year plan. And I said, things are going to happen like this. The, the importance is that we learn from them. And think about what we're going to learn today as we fix this together. We're all here together on the same team. We're going to fix this. We're going to bounce right back. And we're going to have a moat now because the next guy's got to figure this stuff out. And it's only going to make us stronger. And teaching the team about experiment, uh, experimenting, uh, not being afraid to fail, and being in an environment where they're, they're not at a risk of losing their job. Because I've had days where, you know, agencies and, and not my team's pretty good, but there have been times where my team has made a misstep. I've made, I make missteps all the time. 
my my my, my agencies, you know, misspend forty thousand dollars in a day with with no return because everything's broken or whatever. And it's like, oh my gosh, like yes, you want to be as careful as you can, but things are going to happen. Take it as a learning experience, and then all of a sudden, people are like, oh, I'm not getting fired. <laughs> I better learn shit. And, you know, I can't yeah, do it again. Right. But the leader stepped in and and held my hand, and we together figured it out. Versus saying, you better figure that out right now. Like it's like I got you. Let me see. That's why I learned how to code. I learned Shopify's liquid code platform. I learned Photoshop. I'm not the best at it. That's why I hired the best people. But I know enough that I can talk and hopefully earn the respect to people I'm recruiting when they're like, "Oh, you you know, you're just a marketing guy. You don't understand stuff." I might not be able to code it. I might not be able to make it. But I, I understand it enough to understand how hard it might be. Like my designers have told me multiple times, like Josh, it's such a relief working with you because. I used to be thrown like, I need this banner done by tomorrow. I need this web page done by tomorrow. And design is a process. You understand what, what it takes. It, and that's huge. Empathy is, is, is massive as, as, a, as a quality for a leader. Thanks for sharing that. I totally resonate with that, Josh. I mean, I think, you know, asking for help, as you say that, it's, it's so important. And I think for me, it comes into sometimes I don't even know I should be asking for help. Like you said, you're just used to doing it yourself. And so that's what you, what you do. And then you don't even realize you should be asking, right? right. And so I, I totally resonate with that. So thanks for, for highlighting that. Um, on the flip side, some of the proud moments. And then we'll show what is in the what? bag. <laughs> Let the cat out the bag. <laughs> yeah. um, proud moments. I'm proud every day. You know what? Uh, I'm, I read the hundreds of reviews that come in mm -hmm. uh, from our customers and how they're able to smile, you know, I read them and, and it's and you read them and, and they say for the first time in my life I'm proud to smile. You know I'm I'm 55 years old and for the last 30 years when I laugh I hide my smile or I, in photos I wouldn't smile. It's powerful. And for the first time I'm actually getting complimented at Starbucks because of my smile and they feel more confident. And then um, I would say when people really desire the products we build uh, and create, you know even here like when I'm in town in Arizona which is where I live. Um, and when I travel all over the world, people know snow and they're like, I seen the ads or isn't that the one that so-and-so uses or just that brand recognition is kind of cool. Um, it's not about me being famous. I like being the man behind the brand. I like being part of the team. Um, but you know, for them saying like, I, I've been wanting that product mm -hmm. or from influencers who are just like, yo, I'm obsessed with your brand and I have a, a kit like in exchange, I'll post on my 800,000 following and they're like, and they value the product that costs one hundred fifty dollars, they could buy, uh, or three hundred bucks, but they value it at ten thousand bucks, or they value it at five thousand. Like that, that's really nice. They want and to be it, part of the movement. It seems they seems want like. to be part of the movement, and uh, you know, we're in the business of, of confidence, so instilling confidence in people, helping them smile, and then retailers coming and saying amazing. And I think for me, has been the the, the love and support, uh, which I'm infinitely grateful for, and it's growing like crazy from the entrepreneurship community all over the world. You know, the more podcasts I'm doing, things like that, the, the feedback I get from people, it just it, that's something that that really keeps me going as an entrepreneur is like, wait, people are seeing this, you know, uh, 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 direct response going to brand, going to offline and taking on billion dollar market and all this stuff and winning. And like I realize people want to see the little guy win. And, uh, and, and and we're the little guy. And um, and seeing the love and support that pours out from the entrepreneurship community, from our affiliates. You know, uh, our top affiliate, you know, makes, you know, six figures a month in commissions selling snow. People want to sell our products. They want to literally stop all their campaigns, stop everything they're doing and go all in with me. And, and, and now, you know, I've been getting hit up by nonstop by VCs and investment firms, et cetera. They're seeing what we're doing. And just like kind of that recognition of like, because I see three years ahead, five years ahead, that's my job. But when you start to see customers see where it's going and asking for more, like come out with toothpaste, please. I'll buy every toothpaste you have. And I get messages all day from entrepreneurship it's community. It's tough like, to push that off, right? It is. Yeah. It is. So that, those are proud moments yeah. every day. Overall, I'm just proud that, you know, I'm just proud that we just keep pushing forward and, 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 and we're not going to stop. You know, I'm proud yeah. of that. Josh, I have to say from the subtlety, what I love from the direct response standpoint is what you guys focus in on, which is the result. And I think it's subtle when you talk, but you talk about confidence. You, you don't talk about teeth whitening, really. You talk about the result 
and you're so honed in on the customer and what their result is going to be. And those are the things you talk about, right? With confidence, and everything. So I, I just want to point that out for people, how you guys focus on the results, not the actual features and you know, features piece, but the results that the end customer gets. So thank you for sharing that. And let's uh, show us what you got. Yeah, so I'm excited. So first I'm gonna show you uh, what we currently have. So we have about you know half a million uh, uh, customers who use this product here. Um, this is you know, newer packaging, but um, this is uh, the one that plugs right into your phone, your Android, tablet, mm -hmm. etc. Um, and this is our, you know, all in one, uh, bundle kit here that comes in, you know, in our travel bag. And, uh, we've got customers. It, I thought it was hilarious. Customers are reselling, you know, the travel bag we give with the order on eBay and Etsy and all that. Um, you know, this is our maximum strength, uh, serum in here. So this is what currently comes in. And, you know, we like to think, you know, every single one of our customers, um, you know, they are, they are investors. You know, people say you didn't raise any outside capital. Like we did we, from our customers. And that's the, that's the best investor to have is, is a customer who's paying real money, 500,000 people who said, I'm going to give this a shot. And we have less than a 1%, uh, you know, return rate, even though we give a results guarantee, a five year warranty. Um, we really stand by our products, but this one I'm excited for because, um, uh, we got hit up by GQ magazine and vice uh, news network and they do a show with the rapper two chains and they said, we love your brand. We would love to feature you on the show. So I went out to Vegas mm -hmm. and film and I said, well, why don't we feature this product? And so this here is, um, you know, Swarovski crystal I'm blinded. No, edition. <laughs> right? and so this is our Swarovski crystal edition. It opens up just like this oh. and this you can imagine, sitting on you know a marble vanity um you know 24 7 we wanted something that really stood out it's a ten thousand dollar teeth whitening kit every crystal's hand placed mm -hmm. um you know this is gold uh it's got the red kind of uh, styling up top and then you open it up and you've got the mouthpiece here and this is a. Uh, uh this mouthpiece is this was very difficult for us to create and, and we've got um you know one pad i'm really excited about um, that we worked really hard on is around wirelessly charging mouthpieces. Mm. So it wirelessly charges inside of the dock. When you uh, close it, it actually goes through a self sanitization uh, process wow. where it kills 99% of the bacteria using ultraviolet. Um, and then on here, I don't know if this one's charged. There we go. So shake to wake technology. Mm. So it's really like a wow. uh, so it's, all the technology in here it automatically detects the shades of each quadrant of your smile. Um, and adapts. It gets smarter the more you use it. It's powered by an app, um, and the app you can turn it on, off. You can mm. choose the white strength. You're in snowflakes every time you use the product, which you can you know cash in. And then we added on this one, we added uh, red light therapy. So the red light therapy is great for stimulating uh, gu um, gum uh, gum flow, blood flow. You know, gingivitis germs help to pre prevent against the, the germs there. We put some crystals around the edge, so when you have it in your mouth, you got the gold mm. and and then when you're ready to stop, you just do that. Or you can power all through the app. So we wanted it so that, um, you know, and we're going to have a lot of fun with the, you can imagine the ads of people just shaking to turn Amazing. it off. And in their mouth, boom. And our serum uh, inside of here is actually photocatalytic, which means it actually responds to the nanometric range that we use inside of this. Our proprietary serum is actually formulated to be accelerated by our technology. Uh, and that was very important for us because we didn't want to just put a light out because everybody's putting a light out. Like we wanted something that really, really worked. And my engineers, they've been engineering for, for 30, 40 years. They're, mm -hmm. well, and they've worked with some big companies and this is part of their life passion as well. They will not, uh, they're, they're funny. I send them all the competitor products and they break them all down and, and they're like, this is crap and then this is this. And, uh, and I said, and, and they have this passion and they've never sold beauty products in their life. And I said, guys, I'll show you how to sell beauty products um, together. I just want something that is you're proud of, that works. We were at CES, um, not with this diamond edition, but the regular edition of this, by the way, you get the exact same serum, the formula is the same, the mouthpiece, the app, everything's the exact same, except the gold and Swarovski, it's 299 bucks. And we just introduced a payment plan where you can take it home for 25 bucks um, and, and it's yours. So. You know, for less than the cost of a lot of other products out there, you're taking home the world's most advanced teeth whitening system. So anyway, I want to show this off. It's awesome. Um, I've seen it. Um, Love it. The show will be coming out soon. Check it out. TrySnow.com. Where else should we point people, Josh? 
I, I'm on Instagram, Josh Snow, okay. J-O-S-H Snow. Uh, I post a lot on Instagram. I'm starting to do a lot more on LinkedIn. Uh, Facebook, you can always add me on there. Wherever Facebook has a limit of 5,000 friends, so I'm careful with that. But uh, feel free to reach out. You have, uh, you know, whatever it is that it, that comes across your mind during this interview. I, I I read every message I get. Sometimes it takes a week or two, but I, I try to get back to everybody because uh, without without the support of our customers and the support of our community, we would not be where we're at today. Thank you. First, want to thank you. Go to trysnow.com. Josh, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Find the same right now I feel like a hundred grand